We sometimes hear that China's rise will be peaceful because China's relations with its neighbours have historically been peaceful based on its tribute system. But if the idea of the tribute system is deeply flawed in the first place, then how seriously can we take this idea? I've talked about the tribute system and what that is and some problems with it before in some previous videos. What I'm talking about here is this idea that the tribute system was based on the acceptance of Chinese cultural superiority by neighbouring states and that acceptance was expressed through tributary relations and as a result, China's relations with its neighbours were therefore peaceful and stable and there was no need for China to use military coercion to keep China's neighbours in place. Some commentators have picked up on this idea and have been suggesting that as China rises, as it becomes more powerful, we may well see China's relations with its neighbours and also, perhaps broader internationally or even globally, China's relations with other states will be peaceful because this is somehow inherent to Chinese culture. In other words, we will see a kind of new form of the tribute system emerging over time. Just to be fair, I know that China has been getting an awful lot of bad press in recent years, particularly in the West. There are a lot of very unfair and poorly substantiated and over-politicised things said about China. For example, how there's some kind of nefarious plot by China's leaders to take over the world in various ways. Lots of this simply isn't true. And I do understand people wanting to push back on this kind of narrative. However, sometimes this pushback goes a bit too far and becomes poorly substantiated itself. And one of these quite problematic narratives which has emerged is around the tribute system and the almost inevitably peaceful rise of China. So let me talk about some of the criticisms of this that we find in the scholarship. There's a really great article by a professor at Georgetown University in Washington DC called James Millwood. He's really challenging this idea that China's relations with its neighbours were peaceful. He points out that the Qing Empire, when it was at its height, it was literally twice the size of the Ming Empire which had come before it. So it hugely expanded and it didn't expand as some people want to argue through some kind of cultural osmosis that peoples on the outskirts of the empire sort of naturally adopted Chinese cultural values and customs and so the empire expanded sort of naturally and peacefully like water soaks through a sponge. In fact it expanded through force and through warfare. Another historian, Professor Joanna Whaley Cohen, she's at NYU, actually I studied with her uh, while I was over there on my PhD program. She's done a lot of work on the Qing and how they systematically used culture and rituals to express and celebrate their martial values as a way of supporting their practical military behaviour. In other words, this was very much a martial empire. To illustrate this, I'm now going to quote a couple of paragraphs from an article that she published. It's quite a long quote, but that's because there was a lot of warfare going on. She says, Among the significant wars of the Hai Qing were several that resulted either in imperial expansion or in the consolidation of Qing control over outlying territories. These included the wars against the Zangers, a subgroup of the Western Mongols with imperial ambitions of their own, which began with the Kangxi Emperor's campaigns of the 1690s and continued intermittently until 1759. Together with the Ili and Muslim campaigns of the late 1750s, the Qing wars against the Zangers culminated in the destruction of the Zunger people and the annexation of Xinjiang vast territories in Central Asia that brought the empire governed from Beijing to its greatest extent ever. Other imperial wars of the 18th century included the invasion of Tibet in 1720 when Qing troops expelled occupying Dzungas and began a lengthy period of Qing domination. The suppression of a Muslim uprising at Ush in Xinjiang in 1765. The two Jinchuan wars fought for control of the Sichuan-Tibet borderlands in 1740 to 1749 and again in 1771 to 1776. The suppression of two Muslim uprisings in Gansu province in the 1780s and two Gurkha wars of 1788 to 92 
for, to retain Qing control of Tibet. Thus, by the middle of the 18th century, the Qing Empire included, besides China and Manchuria, Mongolia, Tibet and Xinjiang. That is a lot of warfare. And yet, when China gets strongly associated with this problematic concept of the tribute system, all of that gets lost from our understandings of Chinese history. And that would seem to be quite a problem. To be clear, none of this means that China in the future is predestined to be some kind of aggressive warmongering power. It just means it's not a great idea to try to read anything about China's future trajectory off very flawed interpretations of the past, which really don't have much basis in reality. Thank you for watching.